Good afternoon. My name is Gabriel. I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to PayPal's third quarter 2020 earnings conference call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise, and after the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question during this time, simply press star followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. If you'd like to withdraw your question, simply press the pound key. Thank you. Ms. Gabrielle Rabinovich, you may begin. Thank you, Gabriel. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. Welcome to PayPal's earnings conference call for the third quarter of 2020. Joining me today on the call are Dan Schulman, our President and CEO, and John Rainey, our Chief Financial Officer and EVP Global Customer Operations. We're providing a slide presentation to accompany our commentary. This conference call is also being webcast and both the presentation and call are available on the Investor Relations section of our website. In discussing our company's performance, we'll refer to some non-GAAP measures. You can find the reconciliation of these non-GAAP measures to the most directly comparable GAAP measures in the presentation accompanying this conference call. Management will make forward-looking statements that are based on our current expectations, <coughs> forecasts and assumptions, and involve risks and uncertainties. These statements include our guidance for the fourth quarter and full year, the impact of our acquisitions, and our outlook for 2021. Our actual results may differ materially from these statements. You can find more information about risks, uncertainties, and other factors that could affect our results in our most recent annual report on Form 10-K and quarterly report on Form 10-Q filed with the SEC and available on the Investor Relations section of our website. You should not place undue reliance on any forward-looking statements. All information in this presentation is as of today's date, November 2, 2020. We expressly disclaim any obligation to update this information. With that, let me turn the call over to Dan. Thanks, Gabrielle, and thanks, everyone, for joining us on today's call. I hope that all of you are safe and well. I'm pleased to say that PayPal had a very strong quarter across all of our key operating and financial metrics. Our performance is particularly noteworthy given the macro environment. We are battling a pandemic that shows no signs of slowing down. Economies around the world are still quite fragile, and the next 6 to 12 months will be defined by the timing and amount of additional fiscal stimulus and progress towards a widespread and effective vaccine. And obviously, we sit here on the eve of one of the most important elections in our country's history, and I hope that all of you who are U.S. citizens have already voted or will tomorrow. This is the landscape we face as we go into the last quarter of 2020. At the same time, PayPal is at an exciting and meaningful inflection point in our history. Our mission has never been more important. The pandemic has brought focus to the stark reality that billions of people across the world are struggling to get by. In fact, in the past nine months, over 100 million incremental adults moved into extreme poverty. The current financial system is just not working for most people. It's inefficient and expensive for the underserved. Today's environment demands new ways of thinking about our economic system. Emerging technologies combined with mobile phones and financial platforms like PayPal can drive a future of inclusion and financial health. PayPal is in a strong position to help shape a future where everyone, not just the affluent, can participate in the new digital economy. As the use of cash continues to decline, new and innovative financial technologies are rising. For example, central banks around the world are seriously exploring or even trialing forms of retail digital currencies that they issue directly. And it's also clear that digital wallets are a natural complement to all forms of digital currencies. These trends create an opportunity for us to work with central banks and regulators 
to shape a modern and inclusive financial system built on more efficient digital infrastructure designed for the future. The digitization of the global economy combined with the rise of digital wallets will drive our growth over the next decade. Our scale, two-sided network, trusted brand, our strong relationships with regulators around the world, and our AI and data modeling capabilities can all be leveraged to ensure our PayPal and Venmo apps are essential parts of our customers' daily lives. We still have a lot to do to achieve that vision, but let me be clear. We are investing to create one of the most compelling and expansive digital wallets in the world. And you can see this beginning to play out in our strong Q3 results. In Q3, our total payment volume grew by a record 36% on an FX neutral basis to $247 billion, an annual run rate just shy of $1 trillion. Even more impressive is the growth of our volumes excluding eBay, which grew 38%, eclipsing any previous record. And in early October, we hit our all-time highest TPV day, outperforming any previous day in our history. These record results are happening even as eBay moves their base to their managed payments platform. eBay is now just 7% of our total volumes and will likely be between 5 to 6% by the end of the year. Our transactions in the quarter were just over $4 billion, growing 30% year over year. This is the first time we have processed over $4 billion transactions in a quarter. And it's worth noting that our core PayPal daily active accounts increased 32% versus a year ago, consistent with last quarter. We added 15.2 million net new actives in Q3, our second highest quarter for organic customer acquisitions after last quarter's 21.3 million NNAs. We added over 1.5 million new merchants in the quarter, over two times our pre-COVID rate, and we now have 28 million merchants on our platform. We ended Q3 with 361 million active accounts, and we remain on track to end the year with a record 70 million NNAs. This influx of new customers and record transactions grow, drove strong financial results. Our revenues grew by 25.4% on an FXN basis to $5.46 billion. We grew our non-GAAP EPS by 41% to $1.07, even with incremental investments into our sales, marketing, product, and engineering teams. In the quarter, our operating margin grew by 377 basis points from a year ago. I'd like to detail some of our investments and how we see them shaping our future. And let me start with Venmo. Venmo had a very strong Q3 with 65 million users driving $44.3 billion in TPV, up 61% year over year. Venmo's growth continues to exceed our expectations, and we are forecasting revenue for Venmo to approach $900 million in 2021, driven by investments in new capabilities. As Venmo's revenue base diversifies and scales, 
its transaction margin continues to improve. And we now expect Venmo to also make a positive contribution to our transaction margin dollars in 2021. By Q1, the Venmo checkout experience will mirror the ease and simplicity of a PayPal branded transaction. We anticipate a meaningful increase in merchant transactions with some of the world's largest retailers and marketplaces incorporating Venmo as a payment option at checkout, both online and offline, as our QR codes are integrated into physical retail. The Venmo credit card will be fully rolled out in Q1. I think it is the best credit card in the market. It is a true extension of the Venmo app and fully linked into its capabilities. It is the first to have a personalized QR code embossed on the card, as well as a contactless chip, so that transactions can be split right at the table and reflected instantaneously on your Venmo feed. Our cashback rewards are amongst the most generous in the industry and automatically calculate your top spend categories every month to apply the appropriate cashback percentages. I would encourage all of you to try it as soon as you can because it is truly a best-in-class experience. Over the next year, both the Venmo and PayPal apps will undergo a fundamental transformation intended to dramatically increase their functionality and drive engagement. Our goal is to provide our customers with a comprehensive set of services and tools to manage their financial lives, as well as enhance their ability to shop both online and offline. This expanded suite of services will include enhanced direct deposit and check cashing, budget and savings tools, bill pay, investment alternatives including crypto, subscription management, buy now, pay later optionality, and all of Honey's shopping tools from wish lists, price monitoring, deals, coupons, and rewards. An important enabler of engagement is our comprehensive push into the physical world. Our consumers, merchants, and regulators all believe that PayPal plays a crucial role in allowing safe, digital, and contactless payments. Our goal is to be the most ubiquitous payment capability in the offline market through a combination of QR codes, contactless cards, NFC inside our mobile apps, as well as our embedded PayPal wallet experiences inside Google Pay and Samsung Pay, among others. As I mentioned, Honey's shopping tools, coupons, and rewards will be integrated into our Omni checkout solutions, assuring the best deals for our consumers wherever they shop. And we will also enable merchants of all sizes to access anonymous demand data so that they can drive incremental sales and increase customer engagement across their multiple channels. Our move into physical retail will no doubt be a multi-year journey, but we are already seeing strong early adoption of our QR code solution. We have 10 major retailers signed, including CVS, Nike, Toomey, Bed Bath & Beyond, and Samsonite. And we are in meaningful discussions with well over 100 large retailers. We have also signed 20 channel partners and point of sale providers from Verifone to Audion, who are in the process of integrating our QR codes with an additional 70 channel partners in deep negotiations. Just the signed deals alone 
enable our QR capabilities at millions of merchant locations. We anticipate ending the year with over 500,000 small and micro merchants accepting our QR codes. Finally, I'd like to discuss our recent announcement to increase the utility of cryptocurrencies as well as embrace new forms of central bank digital currencies. We are entering a new era of financial services where our wallets and all the services around them are moving from physical to digital. These include identity management, new forms of commerce, and fully digital payments and financial services. As such, we recently announced that PayPal will allow account holders to buy, sell, and hold cryptocurrencies, first in the U.S. and then expanding to international markets and the Venmo platform in the first half of next year. Importantly, we are doing this in close partnership with regulators. As you saw, the New York Department of Financial Services granted PayPal a first-of-its-kind conditional BIT license. With this foundation in place, we will rapidly move at the beginning of next year and allow consumers to use cryptocurrencies as a funding instrument to shop across all 28 million of our merchants. The solution will not involve any additional integrations, volatility risk, or incremental transaction fees for either consumers or merchants, and will fundamentally bolster the utility of cryptocurrencies. This is just the beginning of the opportunities we see as we work hand-in-hand -hand with regulators to accept new forms of digital currencies. We are at a moment in our history where all of our past efforts, our scale, brand reputation, and regulatory relationships position us to play an expansive role in our customers' lives. There is obviously plenty in the near-term macroeconomic environment that makes us cautious as we look ahead to Q4 and 2021. At the same time, we see multiple tailwinds from the permanent shift towards a digital economy. Our revenue and EPS forecasts for the years ahead are substantially higher than those we had developed just a year ago. And I've never been more enthusiastic about PayPal's role in shaping a new future. I'd like to close by thanking our employees who continue to give so much time and energy to supporting our customers while doing their best to balance a blurring work and home life. Their dedication and commitment to PayPal and our customers is inspiring. And with that, I'll turn the call over to John. John? Thanks, Dan. I'd like to start by also thanking the entire PayPal team for their efforts to serve our customers and execute on our priorities. PayPal's third quarter was one of the strongest in our history. The sustained momentum in our business allowed us to outperform. Our results demonstrate the strength of our diversified platform, our global reach, the scalability of our business, and our sustainable earnings power. Notably, we delivered these outstanding results against the backdrop of eBay's managed payments transition, continued weakness in the travel and events verticals, and a decline in other value-added services revenue. Relative to our expectations going into the third quarter, eBay's payments intermediation proceeded faster than we had anticipated. In addition, the recovery in travel, travel volumes was slower than our forecast. Travel and events volumes, which represented slightly more than 10% of our TPV last year, were down 40% year over year. While this is an improvement from the de decline in the second quarter, it makes our overall volume growth even more remarkable. Now I'll discuss more details of our financial performance for the third quarter. Revenue in the third quarter 
increased 25% on a currency neutral basis to $5.46 billion. Transaction revenue grew 29% on a currency neutral basis, representing 11 points of acceleration from the third quarter last year. This growth was primarily driven by strength across our core PayPal business, including strong cross-border growth. Notably, transaction revenue, excluding revenue from eBay, grew 31% in the third quarter, accelerating approximately four points from Q2 and approximately seven points from Q3 last year. Other value-added services revenue declined 10% on a currency neutral basis. Reduced interest income on customer balances from lower interest rates and less credit revenue contributed to this decline. Honey contributed approximately one and a half points of growth to total revenue, which only partially offset the headwinds to other value-added services revenue. In the third quarter, transaction take rate was 2.06%, and total take rate was 2.21%. The 15 basis point decline in transaction take rate was driven radically by the impact of 47% growth in P2P volumes, merchant volume mix, which includes incremental bill payment volumes, and a reduction of $87 million in international transaction revenue from foreign currency hedges. The 24 basis point decline in total take rate resulted from each of these factors, as well as lower other value-added services revenue. Transaction expenses hit a record low rate of 82 basis points, driven by both funding mix and volume mix in the quarter. Transaction losses were 13 basis points as a rate of TPV, one basis point better than Q3 last year. We continue to improve our loss performance through the ongoing advancement of our risk mitigation strategies and enhancement of our risk models. Credit losses were one basis point as a rate of TPV. Fewer originations in conjunction with a consistent macro outlook and no meaningful change in credit quality relative to the second quarter contributed to this lower rate. As you'll see in our 10Q, our loan loss reserve coverage ratio increased from 22% to 24%, which is primarily driven by the contraction of our merchant receivables portfolio. Moving to our non-transaction related expenses, Consistent with our remarks when we reported second quarter results, we are increasing our organic investment spend in the back half of the year. This environment has created a unique opportunity for us to advance our leadership in payments and extend our competitive advantages and emerge from this period stronger and better positioned to increase our relevance. While this incremental investment is more heavily weighted to Q4, we began deploying these funds in Q3. Non-transaction related expenses increased by 23% from Q3 last year, reflecting this increased level of investment. While sales and marketing spend was higher as a percentage of revenue, this was more than offset by leverage across each of our other non-transaction related expense line items. Overall, we realized leverage of 50 basis points on non-transaction related expenses. Operating mar margin for the quarter was 27.2%. This is the strongest performance we've reported for any third quarter and represents a 377 basis point improvement from last year. We continue to be focused on delivering operating efficiencies while investing in our strategic priorities. Non-GAAP other income declined by $57 million relative to last year driven by increased interest expense from a higher debt balance and reduced interest income on corporate cash from lower interest rates. From a modeling standpoint, we expect this line item to continue to be a net expense in the near term. For the third quarter, non-GAAP EPS increased 41% to $1.07. The timing of our incremental investment spend, which is weighted more towards the fourth quarter, contributed to this strong performance. We ended the quarter with cash, cash equivalents, and investments of $17.6 billion. In addition, we generated $479 million in free cash flow. 
Lower free cash flow in the quarter resulted primarily from higher cash taxes. The core cash generation of the business remains extremely strong. On average, in 2020, we've generated approximately $1.3 billion in free cash flow each quarter. And for the full year, we continue to expect to generate more than $5 billion in free cash flow. I now want to shift to our expectations for the rest of 2020 and 2021. In reinstating guidance in July, we were, we were providing our best estimate of performance for the back half of the year. The degree of difficulty inherent in providing an outlook was and continues to be significant. We are an important part of the foundation of global commerce and do not operate in isolation. COVID rates, quarantine measures, stimulus programs, election outcomes, and the normalization of economic activity all affect our estimates. What we do know is that our business is very strong. Our core business continues to perform at an unprecedented level. We've seen a step change in e-commerce penetration this year. We expect there to be a deep and permanent change to commerce and consumer behavior both in the U.S. and internationally. While it's difficult to quantify the precise degree to which secular trends will be affected by the pandemic, our addressable opportunity has grown meaningfully. Our fourth quarter forecast contemplates sustained strength in our business, reflecting the powerful value proposition of our two-sided platform and the profound shift in consumer behavior we've seen this year towards e-commerce and increased digitization. Relative to a few months ago, we expect a greater impact on fourth quarter revenue growth from eBay's payments intermediation, given the pace of merchant migration in the third quarter. Heading into Q3, we anticipated this to be about a two-point headwind to fourth quarter revenue growth. We now expect it to be about three and a half points. Over the longer term, a more rapid transition of merchants to eBay's managed payments platform is better for us strategically, financially, and operationally. It will allow us to contain this impact mostly to the back half of this year and next year relative to a slower progression of merchants with a much longer tail. All of this is to say, and this is a very important point, that while headwinds to our revenue growth and transaction margin expansion will appear more pronounced over the next year from eBay, this impact will be largely contained to that period. Even more importantly, once we are beyond this transition, we expect our volume and revenue growth rates to reaccelerate given the drag that eBay has been for the past five years. During this period, on average, PayPal's revenue, excluding eBay, has grown about 23% annually. By comparison, revenue from eBay's marketplaces business, even including this year's stronger growth prof profile, has grown on average only about 4% each year. On a volume basis, the divergence between these growth rates is even more stark. In addition, we expect the slower rec recovery in travel to persist. While we saw travel volumes strengthen in June and July, we've not seen these levels sustain. We believe this is likely due in part to continued high coronavirus infection rates and the impact of the virus on global mobility. Similar to eBay, the headwinds from travel volumes are transitory and exogenous. As a result of these dynamics, we expect our fourth quarter revenue growth to be in the range of 20 to 25% on both a spot and currency neutral basis. For the full year, this will result in a range for revenue growth of 21 to 22 percent on a currency neutral basis or 20 to 21 percent on a spot basis. This guidance is approximately three points higher than our expectations at the start of the year. To put it in perspective, we expect to add more than three and a half billion dollars to our revenue base this year which is more than one and a half times the revenue we added in 2019. On our call last quarter, we stated that we expected to deliver 25% EPS growth for the back half of the year. We are raising that outlook to 29%. Incorporated into this outlook is 17 to 18% growth in EPS in the fourth quarter, which reflects the increased weighting of investment spend relative to the third. For the year, 
We now expect this will result in approximately 27 to 28 percent growth in non-GAAP EPS, marking the fourth consecutive year in which we've delivered at least 25 percent growth in EPS. Again, to put this in context, relative to last year, on an essentially flat share count, we'll be adding more than 80 cents in earnings for each share outstanding. And relative to our medium-term outlook, which calls for approximately 20% EPS growth each year, we are now more than 30 cents per share ahead of this plan. I'd now like to discuss how we're thinking about our outlook beyond 2020. The strong acceleration we've experienced this year, along with the pronounced shift in consumer behavior, sets us up exceptionally well for the years ahead. I don't think we've ever been more excited or energized about our prospects. We are clearly on a trajectory to deliver stronger long-term growth than our previously guided medium-term outlook of 17 to 18% currency neutral revenue growth and approximately 20% earnings growth on average annually. That said, 2021 still presents a hurdle. Given the transition off of eBay, next year was always going to be a tougher comp for us. Our very strong performance this year adds to this dynamic. In providing guidance this year, our goal has been to responsibly balance transparency with reliability and certainty. Looking at the range of outcomes for the entirety of 2021 requires us to look out over the next 14 months. We are very confident in our opportunity set, positioning, and ability to drive increased engagement. However, there continues to be significant variability in macro-related factors, and we feel that providing guidance for that period right now would require a wider guidance range than we believe is constructive. Once we close out 2020, we'll be better positioned to provide our thoughts for 2021, which we will share in February when we report our full year results. In addition, at our investor day later that month, we look forward to providing more context for our longer term outlook. Our ability to sustainably deliver strong growth at our scale is indicative of the network effects of our business. Our performance demonstrates our ability to successfully execute in the face of a more challenging operating environment, as well as the strength, diversity, and resilience of our platform. This is really a year unlike any other. In many ways, our collective experience has demonstrated that we've never been more connected or more dependent on one another to help each other, drive prosperity and development, and realize the promise of globalization. PayPal stands at the center of this. In 2020, we will process more than $900 billion in payment volume and serve approximately 375 million customers. We are the largest open digital platform for payments globally, and the events of this year have served to strengthen our value proposition and relevance. We have an important role to play in facilitating commerce and payments, and we're executing our plans with an urgency to meet the growing needs of our customers in this increasingly digital world. With that, I'll turn it over to the operator for Q&A. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to remind everyone in order to ask a question, press star and the number one on your telephone keypad. We ask that you please limit yourselves to one question at a time, then simply queue up again if you have any follow-up questions. We'll pause for just a moment to compile the Q&A roster. Your first question will come from the line of Darren Peller of Wolf Research. Please go ahead. All right. Thanks, guys. You know, I know you're all holding off at this point on guidance given the macro uh, variability, but, you know, coming off a year with 70 million net new actives, which, you know, is at least 30 million more than you would have expected, and a lot of these are new demographics rather than a pull forward, as you guys have talked about, can you just talk, maybe touch on the types of NNAs you'd expect for either 21 or even longer term kind of additions you can add, and, and really thinking about that in context to 32% growth in daily active users you know, what are we talking about in terms of opportunity there? And really, what are the drivers of it? Is it international, all the partnerships? It seems like there could be a long runway, but a lot of people, I think, just want to hear where, what the sources are. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Hey, Darren. It's Dan. Thanks for your question. Um, so we had another 
strong quarter uh, for NNAs, um, our second highest organic uh, quarter for uh, net new actives. By the way, interestingly, um, the shape of that, you know, is very consistent. Uh, approximately 5 million net new actives each month uh, coming in, no fall off, no pull forward, just consistent growth uh, in that uh, metric. And as you know, we're still uh, targeting uh, and feel uh, comfortable with the uh, 70 million number that we gave uh, last quarter uh, for NNAs for the year. I think a couple of important things uh, to point out here. First of all, the number of new merchants that are coming on the platform um, is, remains quite elevated, you know, over 1.5 million merchant accounts uh, this quarter. You know, our run rate pre-COVID was somewhere around 500 to uh, 750,000. Um, so now we've got 28 million merchants uh, on the platform and, uh, and you know, 361 million total active accounts. In many ways here, scale begets scale. Um, as, uh, as we grow, uh, as more and more merchants have PayPal, you probably have noticed as well, more and more merchants are putting PayPal front and center. Uh, we're creating new and more compelling ways to buy. Our buy now, pay later um, has exploded into the marketplace. We've just rolled that out uh, to the vast majority of our consumer base. We're seeing huge take up in that and incremental halo uh, as a result of it. And so my view on net new actives is um, we're going to continue to see good growth on that for a couple of reasons. One, uh, our checkout experience and the number of products that we're putting out there is just increasing. You heard me say in my remarks, uh, we are very focused on expanding um, our digital wallet capabilities, both on Venmo and PayPal. We are very serious about driving uh, towards being an everyday use case. Why is that so important? When somebody uses two or more of our products, say checkout and P2P, their churn reduces by 50%. And think about as we approach 400 million uh, consume, uh, customers on our platform, you know, every basis point of churn reduction matters a ton in terms of our NNAs uh, going forward. And so right. I think um, you've got um, um, a continued drive, every industry towards digitization, more and more merchants coming on, more products, more functionality, uh, and reduced churn. Um, and I think um, um, as we look forward, um, I think NNAs will continue to remain elevated uh, versus pre-COVID levels. All right. Thanks a lot, Dan. Yeah, you bet. Your next question will come from the line of Ten Jin Huan of J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Hi. Thanks so much. Uh, here, I, I wanted to ask on the uh, – on some of the KPIs, I think they're related, if you don't mind me just putting them all together. So, so TPV accelerated while transaction revenue growth held pretty constant. Uh, and I know you talked about the take rate here, John, but can you maybe unpack it for us a little bit more and, and help us on how it might trend in the fourth quarter and, and maybe even in 2021 with eBay and Paymentis and, and PayPal and, and everything else, and then separately but somewhat related just, just looking at the fourth quarter guide, I know you're assuming some deceleration from the third quarter. I heard the eBay being a, a point and a half incrementally uh, weaker here. Any other call-outs uh, beyond, you know, conservatism? I totally get why you're not giving 2021, but I know a lot of moving pieces going into the end of the year here. Thank you. Sure, Tenjin. It's good to speak with you. So we did see a strong acceleration in TB, TPV in the quarter, and aside from just growth overall in the business, there's – couple things to call out. Uh, I think notably uh, P2P volume was up almost 50%, 47% I believe is the exact number. Um, and then we saw uh, uh, a lot more volume from bill pay with the 100% ramp of, of Paymentus in the quarter. And so um, good strong growth there. As it relates to revenue, we had a 
a $17 million hedge loss in the quarter, and that relates to a $70 million hedge gain in the prior year. So you've got, um, uh, you know, the, the difference there that uh, really put pressure on the, on the revenue side relative to, to TPV. On, on take rate, there's, there's a couple of dynamics to think about, too. Um, you know, you got, um, while well, well, P2P and bill pay tend to have uh, uh, lower take rates, they also have lower transaction expenses. And so what we, what we consistently focus on in our business is not necessarily take rate, but the incremental transaction margin dollars. And a way to think about our business in the quarter, Tingen, like for every dollar of revenue, of incremental growth that we brought in in the quarter, almost 70 cents of that fell to the transaction margin line. And so it shows that there's a good balance between those items that, you know, maybe have a lower take rate, but also have a lower transaction expense. So we're very focused on the, uh, the margin profile of those different elements of our business. With respect to uh, the fourth quarter, the, you know, the, the only thing I'd call out in addition to eBay, which, you know, we, we, we talked about in our prepared remarks, um, the travel and event vertical, as I also mentioned, has been uh, slower to recover, to recover than we anticipated. Again, we saw some green shoots back in June and July, um, and uh, you know, those haven't persisted to the extent that, that we mentioned. But you know, I, I, again, I'll point out, both of those things are transitory. And they really, uh, in terms of the long-term impact to our business, it, it, it's not gonna matter for us. We're very excited about not only what next year holds, but each year thereafter. You know, the, the, the math of each of those is that, yeah, it's, it's a tougher comp for next year, but, you know, when we lap that, we'll be at a place where we actually have accelerated growth from, from that time period. Yeah, and I just add to that, um, like giving a wider range in Q4 just makes sense uh, to go do. It's the prudent thing to do. It in no way takes away from the underlying strengths in our business. I mean, our core remains extremely strong, you know, core PayPal growing at 30% plus uh, in revenue. October was a good month for us. Um, but, you know, you've got uh, everything from virus numbers, lockdowns, which, you know, probably have the benefit of, uh, of helping us as more people are at home spending online. But we bounce that with what is consumer confidence going to look like, What's the economy uh, due to stimulus payments? What's the holiday shopping season going to look like? We've got an election coming up tomorrow, potential social unrest. When we put all of that together, it just is prudent to, uh, to give a wider range. Um, and so um, that wider range uh, to us does nothing um, uh, to take away from the strength we see. Uh, in the business, but we felt it was the right thing to do. Great. Makes sense. Thank you all. Yep. Your next question will come from the line of Jason Kupferberg. Please go ahead. Oh, sorry, of, of Bank of America. Hey, uh, thanks. Good afternoon, guys. So just wondering, as we think about the uh, puts and takes for 2021, I mean, is it fair to assume that the eBay headwind of 3.5% of in Q420 is a decent proxy for next year? And then how we should think about, you know, some of the other uh, puts and takes, whether it be the ongoing travel headwind or obviously you've got a whole host of new initiatives uh, like paying for and in-store, et cetera. Um, so that's the first part of my question. And then just on the second part, uh, regarding this notion of acceleration in the core business, you know, due to COVID, any way to give us a rough idea of that? I mean, if you just take eBay out of the equation, you know, how much do you think your, your, your revenue growth profile has structurally accelerated with a, with a multi-year view, again, excluding eBay? Uh, thanks for the question, Jason. I appreciate um, trying to kind of parse out what uh, 2021 would look like. Uh, let me just say this. Um, you know, there are, there are a number of puts and takes uh, for our business next year. Um, you know, on the, on the sort of headwind side, uh, obviously, eBay will continue to be uh, a headwind next year as, as they ramp through the year. We've been pretty consistent, though, with um, our expectations around the pace of that. Um, and, and we've long thought that they would be largely complete by the end of next year. 
Um, and, and at the same time, you know, we are still maintaining a share of checkout, which is north of 50%. And so uh, this has been very consistent with our, our expectations from the onset. Um, you know, travel and event is going to be largely tied to uh, the path of the virus. Uh, it's an overused term, I know, but um, that's largely outside of our control. And when the world regains mobility, I'm sure we will see a resurgence in that. But the other area that I think people perhaps haven't quite um, taken into account yet is um, the ongoing headwind that credit should be next year. And so th those would be um, all in the headwind category. In terms of uh, things that we're excited about that can uh, help mute that or completely offset that, there's a number of things that, um, that we're doing that we've called out. But, you know, the um, continued monetization of Venmo, the launch of, uh, of Pay in 4 is something that we're very excited about. And then, you know, expanding uh, the consumer wallet with things like uh, bill pay and subscriptions and so forth. So, you know, it it, uh, it puts us in a in a uh, you know pretty good position as we as we look at the new products that we're rolling out. Which I'll say is like our product and technology team has never rolled out more products at, at you know the rate that they are at any time in in my, in my five years here. So, you know, we're exceedingly pleased about uh, about the progress there. Yeah, I mean, I think um, we'd expect our core business to remain strong, maybe even get stronger uh, throughout 21 as we add more and more capabilities. You know, we're seeing really nice adoption very early, uh, obviously, in what we're doing in the offline space, um, the crypto announcement, and just the very early reactions to that are well beyond our expectations, our buy now, pay later value proposition um, uh, is a great one. I mean, for merchants, it's no incremental cost, just increases sales to them, um, it is, and we get to leverage um, uh, the large base that we have uh, right now. And as I mentioned, we've got a host of new services uh, uh, coming on board uh, next year. And as Darren talked about, you know, we have 70 million uh, net new actives that will ride on uh, increased uh, transactions uh, with each of them, counterbalanced by what we always knew was eBay, which is, as John mentioned, a transitory event. Uh, it will play itself out next year and will accelerate uh, out uh, from that. So I think the really important thing to emphasize here is that when we come into our investor day uh, in February, you know, we will be raising our medium-term uh, guidance. Uh, we feel quite confident about that, given everything that we've seen. Uh, 2021 was always going to be uh, the year that we would transition uh, away from eBay. Frankly, I'm happy that that's going as, uh, as well as it is right now and as fast as it is so that, as John mentioned, we take that part of our business that is the slowest growing part of our business and we replace it with the faster growing parts of our core business and other marketplaces. And so uh, for us, this really couldn't come at a better time, the transition uh, from eBay uh, and all the things that we're doing to build our business and shape the future gives us a lot of confidence as we look out at uh, – uh, over the next several years. Well, thank you. Yep. Your next question will come from the line of James Fawcett of Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you very much. I wanted to just build on, on some of the questions, particularly around next quarter and, and that cadence. Um, it looks like – it sounds like, John, from what you were saying, is that there's going to be, going to be some incremental spend uh, in the fourth quarter. Maybe it got started late in the third quarter that is going to impact margins. Can you talk a little bit about, I guess, the contributors to the very strong margins in the third quarter, a little more color on, on how to think about the spending and, and impact on the fourth quarter, and then how we should think about what that margin trajectory looks like um, beyond that, and, and particularly as we head towards a normalized world? Sure. Well, first, James, uh, you're exactly right. The, the – um, the balance of spend of that $300 million that we we earmarked on the last call, 
um, is going to happen in the fourth quarter. And, and that's re that really gives you the different margin profile from the third to the fourth. But looking out on a more uh, sustainable There's a data point in, the, in our third quarter results, which I think really illustrates the potential that we have. And, and that's the incremental operating margin that we had in the quarter. And so what I mean by that is for, for every dollar of, of growth that we had in revenue, how much of that fell to the bottom line? And if you, if you normalize for acquisitions, it was roughly 50 cents, 48 cents fell to the bottom line. And, and that demonstrates two things, which I think are relevant and, and hopefully answer your question. But one is just the trends that we're seeing around our core checkout. And, uh, and the, we have an expectation that those persist at, at a higher level than we entered this pandemic period. And so certainly that has implications on our business. But the, the second, and, and equally as important, is what it says about the scalability of our business. You know, we, we in the past have not always done the best job of, of, of growing at a low marginal cost. And for the past two or three years now, we've, we've, very, we've demonstrated very well our ability to do that. And, and, you know, ours is a platform that performs very well uh, in, in a growth environment because it, we can do it at a very low marginal cost. And so that's what you see in that operating margin performance. So, you know, I, I would say that, um, you know, there's a, a natural tendency as we grow that margins are going to want to increase. That said, um, we also recognize we have a tremendous opportunity in front of us with the change that's happening, and we clearly want to invest into that. But it's the right thing to do in the fourth quarter, and it will be the right thing to do uh, going forward. I think, fortunately, given the financial profile of our business, we've been, uh, we've been able to demonstrate that uh, we can both do that and expand our margins, and, and we anticipate doing so going forward. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Your next question will come from the line of David Togut of Evercore ISI. Please go ahead. Thanks so much. Uh, could, you, could you dimension the impact on uh, PayPal's ecosystem from introducing cryptocurrencies both to buy, sell, and hold and to use as a funding mechanism uh, in the PayPal wallet? And if it's used as a funding source, can you help us think through uh, the impact on transaction expense you know, would that be similar, let's say, to ACH or, or debit funding? Yep. Uh, hey, David, I'll take uh, that question. Um, so I just take a, a step back. You know, uh, clearly the world um, is rapidly move, moving from physical to digital, and that's so true for payments uh, and, uh, and financial services. Um, you know, my conversations um, with uh, central banks with the regulators, um, with a number of folks in the um, uh, in the crypto field. Um, there's no question that digital currencies are going to be um, rising in importance, having increasing functionality and increasing prominence. Um, CBDCs, from my perspective and all my conversations are a matter of when and how they're done, uh, not if. And I think that our platform uh, with its digital wallets um, and the scale that we have right now um, can help shape the utility of those currencies. That can range from interoperability between wallets, between the currencies themselves, and importantly, uh, into our um, network of merchants uh, for commerce. Um, and I do think that our platform um, and all the new digital infrastructure that we're putting in place right now um, can help make that management and movement of money more efficient and less expensive and faster. Um, just in terms of what we've introduced um, with buy, hold, sell, we did a lot of research on that. Uh, our base um, is very eager for us to offer these capabilities. Um, it really came up very high on, uh, on their wish list, and we are seeing that um, come into uh, fruition 
very quickly. Now, we've only rolled this out to 10% of our base. We did that a couple of days ago. Uh, but our waiting list was two to three times what our expectations were. We're going to take up our $10,000 limit per day to $15,000 uh, per day based on the demand uh, that we're seeing. And we'll roll out to 100% uh, in the U.S. Um, in the next two to three weeks. We're then going to expand internationally, and we'll expand uh, into uh, Venmo uh, in the first half of next year. So that's what we're starting off with. What, um, and, you know, we're seeing people who have already bought uh, crypto open their wallet several times a day to check on what's happening uh, with their uh, crypto investments. We're beginning to already see some halo effects that go on with that. But what I'm really excited about is what we're going to introduce next year, which is um, I think going to dramatically increase the utility of cryptocurrencies by enabling somebody who holds a cryptocurrency uh, in a PayPal account to instantaneously transfer that crypto into fiat currency at a set rate so volatility is taken out of the equation, um, no incremental fees charged for them to do that transaction from crypto uh, into a fiat and then immediately settle in fiat with all 28 million uh, of our merchants at our current uh, take rates. And so um, you have no additional integration uh, needed at any of our merchants. Um, and this is just an elegant way of using cryptocurrencies as a funding mechanism. Uh, and yes, it, it is a lower cost uh, funding mechanism. Uh, for us in terms of those uh, transactions. But that's just the start of things that we want to go and do um, uh, with uh, crypto uh, capabilities. Uh, over the course of next year, you'll see us move into a couple of different uh, areas. Um, those are the only two we're talking about right now. But I see a lot of, um, of interesting things we can do. Um, with cryptocurrencies, with functionality, increasing functionality, and again, working hand-in-hand -hand with regulators every step of the way, uh, which is so important and what they expect from us in order to be a market leader uh, in the digital currency space. Thanks so much. You bet. And your next question will come from the line of Heath Terry of Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Great. Um, Dan, you've done a lot uh, over the last year in terms of product development between crypto and pay later, so I realize it's a bit of a greedy ask, but when you look at the size of the point of sale opportunity and the success that some startups are having and taking share against the incumbents, I'm, I'm curious where your in-person payment strategy stands at this point and how much of a priority it is for you. Yeah. So, um, I think the best way of thinking about this, Heath, is that every five to seven years, there's a replacement cycle uh, for point of sale. Um, and we are really entering a period of change right now where the operating models for POS have kind of literally changed uh, overnight. You know, payments clearly need to now reside in the cloud, not at the physical uh, retail location. They need to be fully omni. They need to reside uh, on a full platform experience across channels. And I would say that um, being an incumbent, uh, the space does not add any uh, advantage. In fact, you know, they will need to change fundamentally uh, the way that they think about point of sale. And clearly, the tailwinds are moving towards mobile-oriented point of sale. And we want to capture. Um, what is a huge in-store opportunity, be one of the first movers to move to an online full Omni solution and then set that up to take advantage of our two-sided network. Um, and we have uh, a number of plans underway uh, with our iZettel and PayPal here um, uh, teams um, really to try and become 
uh, a market leader over the longer term. And that could be, you know, five to seven years, uh, but you'll start to see us make moves in that. I think that really complements all the things we're doing uh, as we move in store with our consumer base, uh, our QR codes, our contactless payments, um, NFC inside our app, um, as well as embedding ourselves in other star pays. Um, but we're beginning to see, as I mentioned, a lot of early traction in our move in the offline space. And I think there's a really huge opportunity. And we are, as I mentioned uh, last quarter, we are being pulled into that space uh, by retailers and by consumers. And uh, the faster we move, the more opportunity I think we can gain there. Great. Thanks, Tim. Really appreciate it. Yep. Your next question will come from the line of Brian Keene of Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Hi, guys. Just want to ask about the new products, um, in particular the BMPL. Just trying to get a sense of how much incremental volume opportunity is there versus replacing other PayPal payment options. Just thinking about are you going to be able to gain, share, or check out at the merchant site. And then secondly, on the Venmo monetization, I heard the $900 million revenue number. Um, any sense of how that breaks out uh, next year with growth rates from yeah, the Venmo credit card? You know, is that a big percentage of that versus pay with Venmo, et cetera? Thanks so much. Yeah. Um, so I'll start now with uh, buy now, pay later, um, and then uh, quickly go into uh, to Venmo. Um, I'm extraordinarily pleased with the success that we're having with buy now, pay later. Uh, we rolled this out in France. Um, uh, several months uh, before we introduced this uh, into the U.S. and then into the U.K. And um, the uptake that we are seeing uh, in the uh, French market is well beyond any of our expectations. And we just rolled out in the U.S. And uh, the demand is tremendous. And you probably, if you've opened up your PayPal app very recently in the last couple of days, to pay for something on a merchant location, you're probably seeing pay in four uh, pop up um, as a option. I think our value proposition there is second to none. Um, and the reason I say that is it is a beautiful experience um, in terms of the ability to simply easily from a consumer to take a larger purchase and divide it in four uh, payments interest free. Um, we know our consumers. We have a very high acceptance rate uh, as a result of that. And for merchants, unlike any of the competitors that are offering buy now, pay later functionality, we are offering this as part of our service. There are no incremental fees except for the basic transaction uh, fees that we charge uh, merchants today. And so what we are seeing is um, um, – just use of it that's well beyond our expectations. I think it's going to be one of our big growth drivers as we go into next year uh, and into 2022. I, I'm quite high on the uh, the potential of uh, of what we what we'll see with buy now pay later. Um, and by the way, there's a ton more we can do on that too. Um, and and we have got a, a large roadmap uh, around that. On Venmo, um, um, look, um, you know, we put out a couple of things uh, here that are new. We do expect Venmo uh, to approach about $900 million in revenues next year. By the way, we expect Venmo to reach profitability in 2022, uh, and that's another big uh, thing to uh, think about. Venmo is clearly turning the corner uh, right now. These are just like these incremental steps that people have been waiting for, uh, but we are seeing that come to play. And Venmo has a host of new things uh, coming out. They've got the Venmo credit card, which is one. And by the way, I, I said it's best in the market. Like I've been, I've been using the Venmo credit card uh, for the last month or so. It is an incredible experience. I, I really cannot wait for all of you. Um, to uh, to use it and uh, and see just what I mean. Second, we are really revamping the whole pay with Venmo 
uh, experience. It's been a little clunky, uh, more clunky than I would have liked, but by first quarter, that will be as seamless as a PayPal transaction. And we have a ton of extremely large merchants and marketplaces that are anxious uh, to integrate Venmo uh, as a payment mark. Um, and then we obviously have business profiles, crypto capabilities, more basic financial tools, uh, shopping tools coming into that. All of those uh, will add uh, to, the, uh, to the Venmo revenue. There isn't one, one thing that's dominant in that. They're all adding to that. And so really pleased with uh, Venmo's growth and trajectory. And, you know, to see an acceleration in its TPV growth now two quarters in a row, you know, at the scale that it has, it's pretty impressive. Great. Thanks so much. Yeah, you bet. We have time for one last question from Lisa Ellis of Muffet Nathanson. Please go ahead. Terrific. Thanks, guys. Thanks for squeezing me in. Hey, Dan, so you've highlighted a number of times on the call the transformation underway with the PayPal and Venmo consumer apps to add all these new use cases like bill payments, paying for crypto, honey, et cetera. Can you just talk a bit more about how we should think about the operational and financial rollout of this transformation, meaning what's sort of the roadmap or timing of when new functionality will be rolled out? How are you going to be driving adoption? How should we think about monetization, uh, et cetera, just as we look out over the next, you know, 12 to 18 months? <clears throat> yeah. Hi, Lisa. Good to hear your voice. Um, happy to do so. Um, this is probably – one of our, not probably, this is one of our top focus areas, this uh, building out a comprehensive and compelling digital wallet um, for our consumers. Uh, I don't think there's any question as we move into the digital economy um, that uh, apps that um, um, provide a comprehensive suite of interlinked functionality around financial services, payments, shopping, identity management, will be an essential part of our customers' lives. I mean, a daily part uh, of their lives. Now, um, with the wallet, the capabilities that we're talking about are both online and in-store. So that's sort of, you know, online, offline, shopping capabilities, rewards management, being able to use rewards points, translate those to fiat to pay uh, at any one of our of our merchants, and also incorporate that in uh, in store as well. All sorts of financial services. You mentioned a couple of them: bill pay, uh, increasing focus on direct deposit, check cashing, savings, goals, investments, PFM, um, and then integrating all of our Honey shopping tools, crypto capabilities, buy now, pay later. Um, and by the way, Lisa, importantly not just putting all that functionality out into our digital wallet, but creating a UX, a user experience that enables somebody to simply and easily move from one experience to another and have each of those experiences build on each other. And so we will um, start to roll out bill pay uh, this month um, we will, towards the end of the month, we'll start to roll that out. I think you can st uh, expect kind of at the end of the first half of this year for us to have a pretty large uh, UX um, uh, uh, completion uh, design in our customers' hands with a lot of functionality coming out, in my view, in the second uh, quarter uh, and the back half of the year. But I expect to have the predominance of what I just talked about in place by the end of next year. Um, and as John said, uh, we're investing behind this. I'm really pleased, as John mentioned, with um, the delivery uh, and the on-time delivery and the excellence of the, uh, of the applications that are coming out. Um, into our market, and so expect uh, to see a step functionality in the back half of, the, of uh, you know, Q2 of this year, and then to build on that uh, as we go into uh, into the rest of the year. 
Very exciting. Thank you. Yeah, it is exciting. Um, okay, um, I want to thank everybody for all of your uh, great questions. Those were really. Um, um, uh, I'm glad we had a chance to talk about all those things, and uh, look forward to talking to each of you uh, more uh, in the uh, weeks and months ahead. So thank you very much, everybody. Have a good day, um, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. This concludes today's conference call. You may now disconnect.